Um, hello, my name is Sarah Wells. I'm the clinical nurse specialist for lymphoma at the Christie Hospital in Manchester. Um, I've been in haematology oncology for around 19 years now in different formats, and I've been the lymphoma nurse specialist at the Christie for the last five years. Um, my role is as a key worker for all patients diagnosed with any lymphoma in the trust, and that's from diagnosis um, and beyond. And part of that role is supporting the patients, their families and their loved ones. Um, I've been asked today to talk about the active monitoring in lymphoma and here are a few of the um, items that I wanted to go through today and hopefully this may answer some of your questions that you may have. Firstly, what is active monitoring? Who is this for and why has it been proposed? Uh, what does active monitoring entail and what does it look like? What should I look out for whilst I'm on active monitoring? Um, two different elements for where active monitoring can be brought in and that's from diagnosis of lymphoma or following treatment. Um, and what happens when I do have symptoms and what are the next steps? And also what help and support is out there for this patient group? What is active monitoring? Well, it's a terminology that has been changed over the years into different forms. Um, it was previously watchful waiting, watch and wait, active surveillance. Um, it's been changed, I think, partly because of how patients perceived the terminology. Watch and wait was lovingly termed by a lot of our patients as watch and worry. Um, so active monitoring, I think, fits more for this patient group. Um, it's a period of observation rather than receiving medication for lymphoma and when I say medication that can be um, chemotherapy, radiotherapy or antibody therapy and briefly although I will, will go through that more um, that covers clinic appointments, blood scans, um, blood appointments and, and scans, open appointments if symptoms worsen and um, ongoing support from the key worker. Um, Active monitoring is applicable at many um, points in the patient pathway and we're going to concentrate on um, when that happens straight away from diagnosis and um, actually following treatment once the, the lymphoma is in remission and we'll discuss that a little bit more in depth. So who is this for and why has it been proposed? The um, disease group that we do this for is our indolent and low-grade lymphomas, and they are um, slow-growing lymphomas. Some of these um, diagnoses are follicular lymphoma, CLL and SLL, marginal zone lymphomas, and some of the mantle cell lymphomas. They are predominantly the um, low-grade NHLs, although there are some HLs um, that can fall into this bracket as well, and that's the Hodgkin lymphomas. Um, the reason they do this is usually because the symptoms of lymphoma have little or no impact on our normal day-to-day -day life for our patients and it hopefully avoids unnecessary treatments and its side effects. Often patients who have been diagnosed in this disease group um, are asymptomatic so they have no symptoms. Their lymphoma has been an incidental finding. Um, they've attended their GP practice for regular blood tests. They've had a pre-op assessment uh, for an operation that's been planned, or they've had um, other health issues that have been investigated. And lo and behold, um, something has come up on a blood count or a scan has been shown um, some evidence of some slow growing disease. Therefore, there aren't any symptoms to, to treat in most of these patients. Um, and that would be the benefit of, of um, active monitoring is that you can uh, avoid unnecessary treatment. Chemotherapy and radiotherapy, as I say, are the mainstay of these treatments. Um, and they, they do carry side effects. They can be moderate to severe. And it would be great if we can avoid these until absolutely necessary. Um, a lot of patients, though, feel that, you know, they've had a diagnosis, they want it treating and will not treating at that moment in time. Will that impact on the outcome and the, the, the sort of course of the disease? And I can reassure you that it doesn't. Um, are there any other options to um, active monitoring? Well, you know, the, the first um, 
treatment is the first one that you could have. But as we say, we do try and reserve that for when absolutely necessary. Or there is rituximab, which is a, a monotherapy antibody treatment. Um, that is given weekly for four or six weeks. Um, and it can push back really the timeline for a patient needing treatment. So again, those um, side effects of treatment can be brought in a little bit later if active treatment is needed. Uh, when will treatment begin? So there is no set timeline for treatment being um, commenced for this patient group. Um, treatment will begin when symptoms progress, um, when treatment is warranted. So if you're having new symptoms um, and you feel that um, treatment will be necessary, they would start then. If there is a lump that is quite distressing for a patient, if it's unsightly or in an area where patients are really quite conscious of it, perhaps some local radiotherapy could, um, could commence. So as I say, no set timeline for starting or triggering treatment. And actually patients can be on active uh, monitoring for uh, many months, years and even decades. And we have currently patients from diagnosis who are 15, 20 years um, out with no treatment having been had. What does active monitoring entail? Well, again, the, the, there's no set protocol for this. Um, it varies trust to trust. So I was just going to go through really how it looks in our trust. Um, it can be flexible though. So that's something to be aware of. If you do have an appointment and you have um, some, um, you know, something that you need to attend or, you know, trips away when we're allowed to do those, um, you can, we can change the appointments as and when necessary. So firstly, in the first year from diagnosis, we would um, see a patient for review every three months, then four monthly at year two, six monthly at year three, and then annually onwards from year four. Um, what does it look like when you come to clinic? Well, we have a consultation to discuss any changes and these are absolutely any changes. Um, so any symptoms that have progressed since we last saw you, just not feeling quite right and you want to, do to, to discuss those with the clinician. They're monitored um, for any um, symptoms that you had at diagnosis and whether those have um, worsened. Um, and in today's climate, we can do those virtually. So they can be by video or telephone and we can do a full consultation over the phone. And if necessary, you can come in for a face to face. Blood tests, um, they're frequently done when patients come to clinic. They would monitor the full blood count of a patient. Um, and also we can look at the liver function and kidney function on a blood test as well. However, they're not always useful. Um, there is no marker for lymphoma per se in blood. So what are we looking for? Well, as I say, it's the effect of lymphoma on a patient um, in those organs that we've discussed, which would be the bone marrow, the liver and the kidney function. So don't be... Um, alarmed if, if a clinician advises you not to have your bloods done, they can be, be done when necessary and when appropriate. A physical examination. This is usually quite important when a patient may have a lump or a, a, new, a new bump um, and they will usually feel where your lymph nodes are and I'm sure a lot of you are aware where those lymph nodes are um, from the, sort of the neck, the throat, in your um, axilla which is your armpit and down into the groin. They'll also usually place a hand on your stomach um, and that's to feel your liver and your spleen. Uh, again, a physical examination isn't always warranted if there have been no uh, lumps and bumps prior to um, the follow up appointments. Um, it, they may not need to be reviewed and monitored. Um, again, if it's a virtual appointment, these obviously can't be done at those times, but our patients, I'm sure, are usually keeping us updated for any changes. We would scan only if really there's new symptoms and I know this causes some anxiety on our patients and I will discuss that a little bit further on. Um, so if there are any changes following your review, we will likely um, request further investigations. And obviously I've put myself at the bottom, but the most important part of all of this active monitoring is your clinical nurse specialist. And that may be a lymphoma specific or a haematology lymphoma nurse specialist. 
Um, you have constant support from us from the day of diagnosis and throughout, and that um, relationship is very important. You can pick up the phone if there are any concerns, any worries, and we can chat about what those concerns are. What should I look out for whilst I'm on active monitoring? So, you know, it is a two part process and we're both, you know, as clinicians and as patients, we're both responsible for this active monitoring process. So some of um, the onus of, of these symptom changes is on yourself within those three monthly or four monthly visits. And we would want you to get on the phone and tell us if there were any changes. It's rarely one symptom on its own that will cause us an alarm, um, but we can talk through them and we can see uh, what we need to do next. But careful consideration is given to your patient history. So we would be looking for night sweats. These are drenching night sweats where you may have to change your bed clothes. Um, any temperatures and they can happen during the day as well. Any new lumps and bumps, um, again, they will be in the lymph node areas as we've um, discussed already. Any unintentional weight loss, um, so not having been on a diet, you are losing weight and your clothes are getting baggier. Loss of appetite, so you just don't fancy your food or you're constantly feeling full and not managing to really take any appetite and any food in. Increased fatigue and perhaps you're needing to nap more during the day, you're not as active as you were and you are needing to rest more. Uh, frequent infections, particularly chest infections, um, they're something that we would want to be aware of if you're going to have repeat antibiotics from your GP. And as I've said before, just not feeling right. Um, the patient really is the one who will tell us what these changes are and if you're just not feeling right, do pick up the phone and have that conversation with your um, clinical nurse specialist. So on the other end of active monitoring, what happens um, if a patient does have symptoms? Um, so as I say, and I can't stress enough, contact your key worker. They will chat through any of those symptoms that you've had. Um, some of the, these um, lymph node swellings that you can have, we can all have, and it may be a sign of a viral infection that your body is fighting off. And if there was a new lump, we would actually say monitor that for around 10 to 14 days. If it is a viral infection, it may well go of its own accord, and we don't want to over investigate and worry patients unnecessarily. You're not being fobbed off, you are being listened to, it will be documented, and any changes we would want to know. Um, it's not a medical emergency at that point in time, so we have time um, to talk about these changes and get you through into a clinic um, appointment. Usually that's within a week to two weeks, so it's quite a, um, a good timeline for getting a patient in. And actually compared to the diagnosis where it could have taken a number of months to get a diagnosis, you threw the door pretty promptly at your, um, at your hospital. You'd be invited to come back for a face-to-face -face consultation where they could do that physical examination and again take the history of any symptoms and really try and piece that puzzle together um, and see what's happening um, from a physical point of view. We would do those blood tests that we spoke about, um, the full blood count, the kidney and liver function. And they would also be important if a patient, um, often the indolent patients have uh, bone marrow involvement and they can be shown in a full blood count. So we would take those bloods and see what was happening. We'd have more points on the graph there to see the trend of your full blood count and kidney and liver function. We'd perhaps suggest some further investigations um, if we were concerned about the symptoms that a patient had. These may be in the format of a scan and can be a PET scan or a CT scan. Um, we may suggest a lymph node biopsy, and if there aren't any lymph nodes, actually a scan can be helpful in identifying somewhere to, to take that sample from. Um, also, there may be a bone marrow biopsy requested, and especially if one was needed at the beginning of diagnosis, and if there are any changes in the full blood count, so we can look under a microscope and see what's happening with the bone marrow biopsy. Um, at that clinic appointment as well, I think it would be important to discuss what the options are from that point. Some patients are really quite worried about starting treatment or what other treatments are there and, and actually do they want treatment? 
are these symptoms so bothersome that they want to, to bring um, potentially some of those side effects of treatment or are they willing to, to manage those for the moment and, and carry on that observation? Um, so those are things that we want to discuss at that point in time. Once we've done all those investigations, we would invite the patient and probably family member back to clinic face to face to have another consultation to say what the findings would be. So there's a few processes that would happen and hopefully this gives you some idea of what would happen at that point. So I wanted to talk about um, the two different places in a patient pathway where active monitoring might be appropriate. So firstly, from diagnosis, as I say, those incidental findings of patients, um, they, those might not need any um, treatment at that moment in time. And that's where active monitoring might be appropriate. So there is a real adjustment period at this point in time. These patients are, are very anxious. They've had a diagnosis and we're suggesting that they don't have treatment. How do you get your head around that? Well, I'm not sure there, there is an exact way of doing that and it takes time. Um, patients need a lot of information and a lot of help and support at that time. Part of my role would be to support them to answer any questions that they have, talk about any concerns that they have at that point in time and also direct them to appropriate written information and literature. It's helpful to involve, uh, involve the family at that time as well. Um, because they're usually quite anxious and you can direct them some, to some very nice literature on the internet which they can also look at. Um, as I say the diagnosis is often a shock and this um, does take some time to adjust. Um, I think family struggle as well the, you know, the patients who feel well and look well, some family members are a, a bit in denial and, and don't really give the patient any sympathy or really awareness that they've had this diagnosis. They're carrying on as normal and that can frustrate um, the patient who is sat there trying to come to terms with this when the family isn't being sympathetic and, and not really uh, aware of um, the concerns and issues that they're living with. On the other side of that is the, you know, the, the family member who will wrap them up in cotton wool. They'll not let them go out. They'll make them stop working um, and really try and protect them from everything as they're fearful that whatever they do may bring about treatment being required. So that's very difficult for a patient to manage um, and including the family member in those discussions at the outset may be helpful. Um, you know, we say returning to normal is there ever going to be a new normal from, from this type of diagnosis? Well, I, I think I said it then, there would be a new normal. Um, this is always going to be with our patients and it's, um, it's learning to um, have that in the back of the mind, but be able to move forward. Um, what can I do to help? So, you know, our patient group are very keen to um, try and, help as much as they can either prolong their active monitoring, prevent lymphoma coming, staying as well as they can and sort of match fit, I suppose, and, and ready for treatment. Um, you know, it's psychological and, and it is physical. I wouldn't suggest any one diet. Um, I would suggest a, a good healthy balanced diet, um, perhaps less um, sort of um, foods that are, you know, going, going um, into the microwave and that kind of thing or your processed foods um, perhaps looking at your lifestyle as well if you are a smoker or if you're taking in a lot of alcohol is that something that you'd like to address at that moment in time and is this now the prompt to maybe look at smoking cessation and there is a lot of help and support that can help there um, can you go back to work? Well, yes, you, you can if you want to. Um, some patients want to really reassess where they're at and, and look whether that is the right thing for them and they're changing their priorities and may want to go on a completely different tangent and we will support you in that. But, you know, there is an element of psychologically adjusting to this. Seeking help and support, I think, is something that these patient groups can do if they really need to. Um, there's the fear of treatment. This patient group may never have had treatment and often haven't had treatment for any cancer um, and are usually fit and well and have no other comorbidities. So there is a, a, a fear of when that treatment will start. 
I do think having a conversation early on at diagnosis about what what potential treatment can look like may allay some of those fears, um, chat about it, make it a little bit no more normal that eventually treatment will be required and how that looks. Um, and treatment is changing day in and day out, how that looks, how aggressive it is, how mild it is, um, how much time it takes, it really is evolving. I'm aware this patient group, especially in the annual um, checkups, have a real anxiety of visiting the hospital and hospital appointments. This is understandable, you know, at that point they're sort of four years from active monitoring and they are a little more adjusted, they are getting back onto some normality and albeit a new more normality. Bringing them back to hospital then sort of flags that up again that they do have a diagnosis and that can cause a lot of worry. I often get a lot of calls from patients, you know, a week, two weeks before their appointment with a lot of um, you know, new symptoms that they feel that they're having. And actually, when we see them, things are going well, things are going good, they're very, very fit and well. And it is the anxiety that does start before the appointment. If that happens, do try and speak to people, speak to your family about the worries that you're having. Speak to your CNS, your clinical nurse specialist, if they can be of any help in trying to reassure you and get you through the door. Also, as I say, there are virtual appointments now and they may be appropriate for some of this patient group. Um, they can be done um, over the video and they can be done at home with loved ones in the background. Or if you're working, they can be done, you know, conveniently um, over the telephone as well. So there are different ways for these hospital appointments to be managed. How to be vigilant? Well, I know no other group of patients who are more vigilant than this. Um, you know, I would get calls from patients who have um, been feeling their lymph nodes every day. They do it in the shower. It's part of their daily routine. And that is fine as long as you give them no more thought to it. If you've done that initial check um, and you then move on. Some patients can be the other way, though. They're either doing no checking at all and, you know, give all of that responsibility over to the clinicians. And that, I think, is probably a little bit of, of denial there. And I would probably speak to that patient and just say, you know, please do be aware of any of those changes. Have a think once in a while if anything's different and get in touch. It doesn't need to take over your life. And the other side of that um, spectrum is the patient who aren't doing it just every day. They're doing it four or five times a day. They're actually giving themselves bruises in monitoring these lymph nodes. Um, they really are pushing and prodding. And again, that is for us to sit down and sort of, you know, diffuse the situation, talk about these anxieties, perhaps ask and answer some of those unanswered questions um, and, and try and sort of diffuse that situation a little bit. I often get asked making future uh, plans and appointments. Can I? Should I? You know, when is this going to happen? I feel like my life is is um, is waiting um, there for me with this diagnosis. Absolutely. Please do make those plans you were making um, Buy the camper van you were going to make. Take the job role that you were going to to make once you've been offered. We don't know how long a patient will be on active monitoring and, you know, from one extreme to the other, it can be months and it can be decades. So getting um, back to some, some future plan making is absolutely a priority for this patient group. Active monitoring following patients. So this is a different patient group here. Um, perhaps on diagnosis, this patient group have had symptoms um, and they've needed treatment. And what that has looked like for them has been a scan at the start of treatment, three weekly appointments for treatment um, for around 18 weeks, and then a scan afterwards. Um, and hopefully they're in remission at that point. The symptoms are... Um, you know, undetectable and active surveillance has or monitoring has been suggested. I think that can be quite difficult really to go from needing treatment, having treatment, having that intensity of those appointments and some of those side effects to then be rolled out the other end and again said, no more treatment, we'll see you on your merry way every three or four months. That can cause quite a lot of fear in this patient group um, and anxiety. 
And again, it's addressing all of those questions that they would have at that point in time. The initial relief that you know their lymphoma is in remission and symptoms are um, are less than they were at diagnosis, and then you know a month or two later we may get those phone calls through from this patient of you know what happens next, what does happen if I need treatment. There may also be the patient group who've really struggled with the treatment that they've had, um, and they may have a fear of future treatments and an element of PT, uh, PTSD. And again, it's managing that. So, you know, there are some intense treatments um, and they may have had some severe side effects such as in, um, increased fatigue, um, some nausea, um, needing blood transfusions, time off work, all of that. And that, that to live with that fear that it may happen again, it can be very difficult for this patient group. Also, I suppose what future treatment options are, um, some of our patients worry that they've used up one of their treatment options and what is there next for them? Is there you know, a finite number of treatments for this patient group? And again, I think that's sitting down, having another conversation with your medical team or your nurse specialist um, about those, those fears for the future treatments. Are there more left? And reassurance can be given. As I say, the, the landscape is changing hugely for these indolent lymphoma um, patients, the treatments that are on offer, the trials that are on offer. There are options for this patient group. And also there are options for radiotherapy if it's um, a, a, you know, a single site of disease that needs some treatment. So I think to allay again those fears, fears for future treatment is very important. Lack of regular scans. So I hear this a lot. Um, you know, how are you going to monitor the lymphoma if you're not going to scan me? Especially if you've been through treatment, what are you looking for? Um, and the worries that that brings with it. So we don't scan regularly because there have been trials in the past that have shown patients and their history and they come into appointments and telling us any of those changes that they have from that list would highlight any herald of disease progression or new symptoms earlier than scans would. Scans are only able to look at sort of certain volume of disease, whereas the patient who doesn't feel quite right, they're more fatigued, they've got a new lump, although it's pea size, it's, it wasn't there before. These are very important and actually we take a lot of stock in that patient talking to us and being aware that something isn't quite right. So if I can give you some reassurance, we will scan when we when we all agree that scanning is appropriate and important and we will do the scans at the right moment in time. Keeping healthy mentally and physically. I think this is exactly the same as the previous slide. Um, keeping match fit again, you know, treatment is likely to be required again. Doing as much as you can to stay fit and healthy physically. Um, you know, smoking cessation again if that's appropriate. Uh, taking on a little bit more exercise than you did. Keeping fit, walking, and that may help with any fatigue as well that a patient may be having. And keeping healthy mentally. I mean, that isn't particularly easy to do and it's not a given that our patient group can do that um, and I will go through that a little bit more in the slide I have coming up. What I can say though is it's, it's a fine balance all of this active monitoring, um, it's a conversation between yourself and the medical team, it often isn't a medical emergency, we have time to get scans made, um, appointments made when necessary to see you in clinic and we'll bring you through and see you and give you that reassurance and see you when necessary. So I briefly wanted to talk about some of the help and support that is available for our patient group. Um, I'm obviously going to put myself at the top, cl clinical nurse specialists. They are absolutely your phone a friend. Um, where necessary, you ring them, you speak to them, you chat about any changes. You know, those calls can, can be, you know, from months from diagnosis or finishing treatment to years out. That doesn't stop. Um, you have access back to the team. You don't have to go through that route that you went through on diagnosis. You just phone them back up and they can chat um, about any of those worries and concerns. And we're often doing that with the patient and the loved, uh, families of the patient and the loved ones as well, obviously, with their consent um, to support them through it. 
There was some great information out there. Lymphoma Action um, have some excellent literature on their website. Um, they have a buddy system um, and some Facebook sites as well that you can go on. They also have some Live Your Life programs, um, which I've been um, lucky enough to be a part of. Um, and these can help actually with some of the adjustment um, issues that I was talking about earlier. Uh, how to stay match fit and what activities are important. Maggie's, there are quite a few Maggie centres now throughout the UK. Uh, we're lucky to have one here um, across the road from us in Manchester. You can go into them, they have informal counselling there, they have advice um, from benefits advisors and a work advisor if you're trying to get back into work or you're having issues with work supporting you. They also do look good, feel good um, and a lot of other activities which you can book on online and they're doing a lot of those virtually. Macmillan as well, which a lot of more people are aware of Macmillan. Um, they have some great benefits advice, some really brilliant information centres within the hospitals that you can go to and speak to someone outside of your team maybe um, just for a little bit more support and perhaps signposting to other support services. A lot of hospitals now have psycho-oncology services um, within the trust and you can be referred to any of these. Managing that um, active surveillance, that waiting for treatment, waiting for relapse and the end of remission can sometimes need a, a little bit more um, professional help in some of the support and coping strategies. And they're, you know, they're there to help this patient group absolutely throughout and they can often be very, very helpful. We have and a lot of other trusts have a complementary therapy service, although they are um, have been struggling to be face to face at the moment. They are offering a telephone service to help and support our patient group. Um, and they um, can do things such as um, hypnotherapy, relaxation techniques, and when you're able to go face to face, acupuncture and reflexology. Don't forget your work or study area. They're going to have um, HR and occupational health within them. And actually they can um, often help with some of the counselling services that may be out there. I know a lot of schools and colleges have pastoral help as well. So it's seeking that advice where you feel comfortable doing it. You know, some people may not have told um, loved ones or work that they have that diagnosis and work wouldn't be an appropriate work avenue to go for support. So again, go back to your nurse um, specialist and they can look at what avenue is appropriate for you. Family and friends, you know, don't forget them. They are going through this with you to, to a different level. They want to be there to help. Um, they find it usually very awkward and I've spoken to family and loved ones. They don't know what to do. They, you know, they're watching their loved one go through this and how can they be helpful and not be a hindrance? And it can be a bit of a vicious circle that the patient is protecting them and their loved ones are protecting the patient. I think it's, again, sitting down and being honest about what you need from your loved ones and your friends, whether you don't want to tell anyone and that, you know, there's no right or wrong answer in that. Um, but, you know, the, they would probably want to support you through that. And I'm sure if, if you were in their position, you would be wanting to, to help them through that and help them with all the decisions that they're going to have in the future. So there is another element um, that can be involved in active monitoring, which is maintenance of monotherapy, um, such as rituximab or binutuzumab. Um, so these treatments are usually um, every two or three months for around two years. But within that timeline, you actually do slot in with the active monitoring patient group. Although you're coming in and having some form of maintenance treatment, you're still under observation. Um, you're still only being seen twice or three monthly along with your appointments. And those same rules do still apply. So we would be wanting you to monitor for any changes, um, contact us if there are. And again, that whole point of reinvestigation and re-examination and coming face to face to clinic would happen again. Um, and don't wait for that three month appointment or two month appointment. It's, it is still active monitoring and we would want to be aware if there were any changes. So some patients um, choose 
not to have a conversation with their loved ones about having a diagnosis and other ones do want to have that um that conversation with their family members friends and loved ones about having a, a diagnosis of an indolent lymphoma which is a form of cancer and not having treatment and looking so well and that conversation can be very difficult um, for many people there there is a stigma of having a cancer and it needs treating straight away and if they're not treating you then then what's going to to happen and you look so well so you, can you possibly have a, a diagnosis of lymphoma those conversations can be hard to have and the, the communication um, can be very difficult between this this um, this group of people and can put a lot of strain on on the patient and, and worry and anxiety all I can say really is th the support is there to have those conversations. Um, there are helplines from your local hospital, Lymphoma Action um, and Maggie's where patients and those people can go in and they can help have that conversation and pick what you actually want to say, what you want the, the, the people to know um, and, uh, and hopefully be able to, to break it down and, and use them as a sounding board really to help have that um, open conversation and hopefully um, get that flow of communication happening between you all and your loved ones. Within um, this patient group, there is obviously a, a huge amount of worry and um, anxiety regarding relapse of lymphoma and progression of symptoms. Um, and what can we do for that patient group? Well, again, you know, I think it's those early conversations about what to look out for. Um, what will the lymph, you know, what will lymphoma when it does progress look like? Um, and how will it happen and how fast will it happen? So the, again, this isn't a medical emergency. We have time to take time to process this properly, assess whether a patient needs to come in and have further um, investigations done. Um, often your nurse specialist can reassure you with some of these symptoms um, and also talk about those anxieties going forward. Are you ever going to have that anxiety relieved and, and taken off your shoulders? Well, possibly, maybe not. And it's about you know what coping mechanisms and what strategies are out there for you. Um, some patients really might find a, a referral to psychon services very helpful. Some just might find it, you know, a, a, a three, four monthly chat with their nurse specialist um, or phone in helplines that are available. But reassurance can be provided to that patient group, and we're more than happy to do that as professionals.